Well, good morning, my church community. Uh, what a privilege it is to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm what you might call the fourth or fifth string quarterback. You don't know what you're going to get, and I don't know what I'm going to give. Right? But last week, Dan assured me that I was his first choice after the person he originally asked said no. He was joking. But when Dan did approach me, um, he gave me this invitation. Uh, and just like all good Christians, my first response was, let me pray about that. See, that's church speak for yikes. And uh, I need some time to come up with a good excuse uh, why I can't do it. Plus, you don't want to appear so eager that you carry around a sermon in your back pocket and are just waiting to whip it out. So um, I'm privileged to be, to be here. Um, but as our conversation continued, I did ask the question, can I talk about those Sabbath times that are involuntary? Those times of rest that feel as though we've been laid aside, maybe forgotten by God, situations that we have been thrust into that are out of our control or may not be something of our choosing. You see, it has been my experience that during these involuntary, unexpected Sabbaths, I have been the most transformed. It is in those times I have learned more about who God is and who I am in my relationship with God. There is purpose in wilderness Sabbaths. Will you pray for me and with me? O oh Lord, I stand here before you and your people with weakness, fear, and a lot of shaking. My message isn't presented with convincing wise words, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power. I do this so that their faith might not depend on the wisdom of people, but on the power of you. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, for you are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So this summer we've been talking about Sabbath and how, when practiced, it can help us resist the busyness of the world, help us to resist consumerism, and when practiced, can help being, bring the peace of Christ into our lives. It's one of our commandments. Six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. Now, if you know me, you know I'm a person who loves a good itinerary. I love a plan. I love rules and boundaries. I like knowing what's coming up so I can plan accordingly for any scenario that should present itself. This way, I won't be embarrassed, I won't look inadequate or incompetent, and to be honest, a good itinerary helps tamp down my anxiety, which can be a lot. <laughs> It's easy for me to practice a Sunday Sabbath because it's well planned out. There's no real surprises. And it ends with the most intimate meal we can have with Christ, communion. Reverend Oswig said, communion is where we open the movement of God in our lives. That's, that's amazing. It's easy for me to practice in my home with daily devotions where I can rest and relax and read and try to fully be present with God. I practice Sabbath. But what does an involuntary Sabbath look like? Those seasons, we like to call them, those wilderness times that rest, that can strike us without warning. We are resistant to these types of Sabbaths because they can be painful, filled with self-examination, question our, question our faith, and qu even question the presence of God. They can look like a loss, a loss of a loved one, a physical loss, 
a loss of a job. And an involuntary Sabbath can look like grief, a mental health crisis, a physical health crisis, a crisis of belief, those times when we are struggling to find God in the rest and find God in the purpose for the rest. You may have heard these moments being referred to what St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul. The type of Sabbath we want to avoid at all costs, yet it is in these very moments we come to decide how we really see God and how we really see ourselves. In his book, Celebration of Discipline, author Richard J. Foster writes, the dark night is one of the ways God brings into a hush, a stillness, so that he may work an inner transformation upon the soul. I, I want to read that again. The, the dark night is one of the ways God brings us in a hush, a stillness, so that he may work an inner transformation upon the soul. Today's scripture tells the story of Elijah, a man of God, a prophet who is terrified. He is put in a situation he has no control over. You see, he's a wanted man by a woman named Jezebel. Scripture tells us he was afraid and he ran for his life. Fear can do that to us. It can make us run for our lives and for our lives. Fear can grip us so hard that all we want to do is run, where all we want to do is escape the circumstances, the pain, and the unknown. When Elijah finally sits down, he starts where most of us start, with self-pity. He says, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. With self-pity comes solitude, feelings of betrayal, abandonment, disappointment, spiritual dryness, all the things we are told we should avoid and that we should always live in comfort and peace and joy. Elijah does what we all feel like doing from time to time in our fear and self-pity. He pulls the covers up and goes to bed. Foster writes, the purpose of darkness or an involuntary, unexpected Sabbath is not to punish or to afflict us. It is to set us free. It is a divine appointment, a privileged opportunity to draw closer to the divine center, to God. Now, I don't know about you, but when self-pity and fear causes me to run and I find myself moving away from God, instead of toward God, my first thoughts are not, oh good, another divine opportunity, another privileged opportunity, because nothing could be further from the truth. That takes time and work to get back to God being the center of our lives and draw closer to the divine center during involuntary Sabbaths. What has become the center of our life is ourselves and our circumstances. And that is all we can seem to concentrate on. All our practice of Sabbath, all of what we and who we know God to be, all the things we have told others to do during their involuntary Sabbath seems to just get lost. It is in the doing of the work, the wrestling with God, the work of getting back to where God is at the center of our lives, that is what transforms us. So what do we do about it? How do we go from self-pity like Elijah to God-centered? It's a process. The process of remembering and reflecting plays a big part in getting our focus off ourselves and our circumstances and back onto God. Remembering just as he did for Elijah, he will do for you. He will always, and I want you to hear this part if you remember nothing else. He will always pursue you no matter how far into the wilderness you have traveled. And he will always provide 
what you need, not maybe what you want, but what you need for the journey. If you need an image, read uh, Luke 15, verses 3 through 7. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost until he finds it? Jesus will always pursue and rejoice. Jesus says, I have found my lost sheep. Remind yourself and reflect on God's promises. Read scripture, even if you don't feel like it. Just open your Bible and read a verse. Remind yourself of what God has done for you in the past. Why would he leave you now? Remind yourself of the question God asks Elijah. What are you doing here? It's a great question for self-reflection. Along with the questions Jesus asks in the New Testament, who do you say that I am? Do you want to be made well? And my favorite, what do you want me to do for you? How you answer is how you see God and how you see yourself. Remind yourself to seek God first. Foster writes, hold in your heart a deep, inner, listening silence and there be still until the work of solitude is done. I just want to briefly mention too that Elijah never really answers God's question. What are you doing here, Elijah? All he is, can do is respond by reporting how zealous he has been and how bad the Israelites have been. And I hate to admit it, but I have responded in that same way. Lord, haven't I been faithful? Haven't, haven't I listened to you? Haven't I followed you? Haven't I prayed? And while I'm at it, here's a list of all the injustices I felt and what I'm up against. Thinking that somehow, that because I have been faithful, I should be exempt from life's turmoil. Doesn't work that way. I'd like to share a little portion of my own recent story, my own involuntary Sabbath. I think it's one of the good things that comes from a dark night of the soul. You get to share that while things in life can get a little bumpy, there is always something to be grateful for, and your story may give hope to someone else who is in an involuntary Sabbath. So allow yourself to be vulnerable and share. As some of you know, these last few years have been difficult, as I have had some major changes in my life. I retired early to care for my ill husband, who then passed away in October, and I found myself really retired. <laughs> and yes, I was dealing with grief and fear and purpose and anger, a, a full mix of emotions. But there was this one feeling that I just couldn't put my finger on, and because I couldn't name it, I couldn't deal with it. I was here on a routine Sabbath and our associate pastor at the time said these five words, we feel betrayed by God. That was it. That was what I was feeling. I was feeling betrayed by God. I finally had a label for it. Now the question was, what was I gonna do about it? My first stop was scripture. So I turn to my concordance and I find this promise or this covenant in the psalm that God made with David. And it's Psalm 30, or 89, I'm sorry, 33 through 35. It says this, but I will not take my love from him nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn my holiness and I will not lie to David. There in my Bible, at some point in my life, I had penciled through David and wrote my name, Sharon. So I read it again, inserting my name. Well, I wasn't really satisfied with that just one scripture. <laughs> um, yes, it confirmed that God doesn't betray his faithfulness, but it didn't tell me how to get over that feeling of betrayal. So I went to the next best reliable source, Google. I found an article written by April Knapp titled, How to Trust God When You Feel Betrayed by Him. Here is some of what he write, or she writes. 
What feels like God's betrayal is often his faithfulness. What feels like God's absence is often his presence. Our finite minds do not see all the nooks and crannies of every circumstance. Here's what she suggests. Seek God first. Believe in his goodness. God is good. And wait. What? Wait? That's the answer? Oh, there must be more to it than waiting. So the following week, I came to worship and I approached the same associate pastor and said, well, you helped me identify what I was feeling towards God. I'm feeling betrayed, but you didn't tell me how to deal with it. You will never guess what his one word answer was, wait. And so I waited. In my whining, I waited. In my wailing, I waited. In my wondering and my asking why, I waited. In my involuntary Sabbath, I waited. Elijah traveled 40 days until he reached the Mount of God. I traveled eight months until my feeling of betrayal subsided. That once again, God became the divine center. That I was able to recognize his pursual and provisions. And that I could be thankful for this dark night of my soul as it strengthened my relationship with my God. If you read the rest of Elijah's story, you'll find that in the wilderness time, he experiences God in a personal and up-close way. God said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. What are you doing here, Elijah? God asks him a second time. We want God to show up in a big way. I've often heard people say, if he would just write it across the sky, if he would just send me a sign. But if we would just take a breath, quiet our own voice, Sit with God in that uncomfortable silence. I guarantee he will show up in our involuntary Sabbaths, but listen for a gentle whisper. He will pursue and provide, and you will be transformed. Amen.